Good evening. Wow. Good evening. This is Vice Chairwoman Robin Harvey, presiding for Chair Lichter. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, August 22, 2023. I invite you all to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Ms. Kayla Drummond. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and broadcast through the BCPS online live meeting broadcast and on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by a roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is a consideration of the August 22nd agenda. Dr. Yarborough, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I am unaware of any additions or changes to tonight's agenda. Thank you. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open, meeting, the open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals and consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. The summary of the closed session and open session information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters. And for that, I call on Mr. McCall. Good evening, Vice Chair. Like, oh, uh, excuse me, Harvey. <laughs> Superintendent Dr. William, uh, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Yarbrough, forgive me. <laughs> Members of the board, I'd like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, terminations, retirements, and resignations. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in Exhibit D1? So, so moved, moved from Pong. Is there a second? Second, Pumphrey. Thank you. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Tominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D2 and D3? So moved, from Pong. Is there a second? Second, Young. Thank you. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments. And for that, I call on Dr. Yarbrough. Madam Vice Chair Harvey and members of the board, I am bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. Director, Employee Benefits and Absence Management, Assistant Principal, School Improvement, Dundalk Middle School and General John Stricker Middle School, Assistant Principal, Patapsco High School and Center for the Arts and Pikesville High School, Supervisor, 
Family and Community Engagement, Specialist, School Improvement, Department of Special Education, and Office of English Language Arts, two positions. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit E1? So move, Pumphrey. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, second from Savoy. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Boker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Motion carries. Dr. Yarbrough? Thank you. Our first appointment this evening is Kristen Anelli. Kristen is being appointed to the position of Specialist School Improvement in the Office of English Language Arts. With 30 years of prior service in Baltimore County Public School, her experiences include Supervisor in the Office of Title I, Principal at Dundalk High, Director in the Department of Innovative Learning, Assistant Principal at Dundalk High, Resource Teacher in the Office of English Language Arts, mentor at Randallstown High, Dundalk Middle, and Holabird, and middle school teacher. Her prior experience outside of Baltimore County includes sales representative and assistant principal in Penn Manor School District. Congratulations and welcome back to Team BCPS. Our next appointment this evening is Shannon Dawkins. Shannon Dawkins is attending this evening with her sister, Don Lewis, and nephew, Dakari Dawkins. Are they here? Please stand. Thank you. <laughs> Shannon is being appointed to the position of Director, Employee Benefits and Absence Management. With 2.2 years of service in Baltimore County Public Schools, her previous experience here includes human resource specialists in the Office of Employee Benefits, Retirement, and Absence Management. Shannon's prior experiences include HR Business Partner, Manager, Customer Service and Professional Development, Director of Human Resources Development, Senior Staffing Specialist, Senior Account Manager, Assistant Director of Human Resources, and Manager of Training and Quality Assurance. Congratulations. Our next appointment this evening is David Deutsch. He is attending this evening with his wife, Bree. Please stand. <laughs> David is being appointed to the position of assistant principal at Patapso High School and Center for the Arts with his principal, Dr. Scott Rodriguez Hobbs, who's mm -hmm. here as well. I want to give him a round of applause. With five years of service in Baltimore County Public Schools, his previous experience includes physical education teacher at Eastern Technical High School. His prior experiences include teacher and athletic director in Harford County Public Schools. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next appointment this evening is Susan Hahn. Sue is attending this evening with her husband, Bob Hahn. It is being appointed to the position of Supervisor, Family and Community Engagement. With 30 years of service in Baltimore County Public Schools, <laughs> Susan's experiences include Program Specialist and Project Specialist in the Department of Communications and Community Outreach, Parent Support Services Representative in the Department of Professional Development, Parent Services Assistant, Secretary at Harford Hills and McCormick Elementary Schools and Clerical Assistance at McCormick Elementary School. Congratulations. <laughs> Next appointment is Todd Hawkins. Todd Hawkins is attending with his wife, Meryl Hawkins, teacher at Lansdowne. He is being appointed to the position of assistant principal at Pikesville High School. With 21 years of service in Baltimore County Public Schools, his previous experiences include resource teacher and physical education teacher at Lansdowne High School. Prior experiences outside of Baltimore County include teacher at St. Thomas Aquinas School. Congratulations. <laughs> Our 
Our next appointment this evening is Kathleen Scott. Kathleen Scott is being appointed to the position of Specialist School Improvement in the Office of English Language Arts. With seven years of service outside of BCPS, previous experiences include assistant principal, school performance coach, avid teacher, English teacher, and language arts teacher in Anne Arundel County Public Schools. Congratulations and welcome to Team BCPS, Kathleen. <laughs> Our next appointment is April Valensick. April is being appointed to the position of Specialist School Improvement in the Department of Special Education. With 16 years of experience outside of BCPS, her previous experiences include teacher specialist, special education resource teacher, and special education teacher in Anne Arundel County Public Schools, special education teacher in Baltimore City Public Schools, and program coordinator. Congratulations and welcome to Team BCPS. Danielle Vio is our next appointment. She is attending this evening with her two sisters, Camille and Gabrielle, and her father. <laughs> Danielle is being appointed to the position of assistant principal school improvement at Dundalk Middle School. With 13 years of service in Baltimore County Public Schools, her previous experiences include resource teacher at Deer Park Middle Magnet School, and English teacher at both Southwest Academy and Deer Park. Congratulations. And our final appointment for this evening is Erin Wyatt. Erin is being appointed to the position of Assistant Principal of School Improvement at General John Stricker Middle School. With 15 years of service outside of BCPS, her previous experiences include Behavior Intervention Coach and Science Teacher in Hartford County Public Schools. Congratulations and welcome to Team BCPS. Thank you, Dr. Yarbrough, and congratulations to everyone. Our next item on the agenda is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by her staff. Online registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. No speaker substitutions will be allowed. Based on policy 8315 as amended on July 11, 2023, representatives from the following categories are invited to address the board during the public comment period of the board's meeting. A maximum of five spaces will be allocated in each of these categories. School system affiliated groups, unions, nonprofit community groups, and individual citizens or students. So that a diversity of viewpoints receives the opportunity to address the board. When there are more requests than available spaces in any of the categories, first priority will be given to those groups or individuals who have not spoken during the prior two board meetings. When the spaces reserved in any of the four categories are not filled, those spaces will be offered on a first come, first served basis through the waitlist sign up sheet. In accordance with recommendations from the Baltimore County Police Department's Homeland Security Unit and the Office of School Safety, we have implemented the following safety and security protocols to enhance the safety of all attendees. Participants should be seated in the room during the meetings. Individuals who need to stand should go out into the hallway to do so. Participants should not approach the table unless called upon to speak and should not approach the dais. While we appreciate the creativity many have shown during their presentations, materials brought to the table are limited to electronic devices, presentation papers, and posters no larger than 11 by 14 inches. Other items should be left in your seats. Information to be given to the board is to be handed to the staff member who is seated in the front area of the meeting space. Information for other participants is to be left on the designated table outside in the hall. In the event of an emergency that requires an emergency response, such as a lockout, lockdown, or evacuation, staff from the Office of School Safety will direct participants. 
If evacuating, participants will exit through the rear or front door in an orderly manner, leaving the building and cross over to the parking lot or other safe distance as warranted. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. Persons using language that is threatening or promotes violence against a BCPS employee are subject to legal penalties. Persons who otherwise disrupt or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. I ask speakers to observe the three minute clock which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see that the time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If, if not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. I now call on our school system affiliated groups to speak. Our first and only speaker in this category is Jane Lee of the PTA Council of Baltimore. Good evening. Good evening. Dr. Yarbrough, Vice Chair Harvey, board members. I'm Jane Lee and I'm the Vice President for Leadership for the PTA Council of Baltimore County. And I'm here to speak for Leslie and you'll forgive me because I have to read what she wrote and I'm not used to that. Um, while some are just coming back to the school year, we at PTA Council have been busy all year including the summer. We don't get a summer break, so we consider ourselves 12-month unpaid employees. The summer is especially busy. We've been getting our units ready for the new school year and opening and starting new units and reviving others. In this past year, we've revived 25 new PTAs or, or newly revived PTAs. We intend to do more than that this coming year. We are grateful to have taken part in a number of BCPS events over the last few weeks. On July 27th, Ramona Basilio, the chair of our Family, School, and Community Partnership Committee, represented the council at the BCPS Partnership Fair. It was an outstanding event which gave us the opportunity to network with other community partners and let attendees know about the importance of PTA and its role and the PTA Council's role. On August 17th, our President Leslie Weber and Sue Hahn represented the board, to the board, presented to the Board of Education's Equity Committee on the Council's equity, equity work. Due to technical difficulties, our Chair of Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee, Tyrone Bullock, was unable to log in, but we are grateful that Doug Handy and Dr. Savoy are willing to meet with him and Leslie to continue our equity-related discussions. On August 19th, Leslie Weber and Ramona took part in the BCPS Fest, another great event and one at which we think we've talked people into joining our board as well as met hundreds of people. Our efforts to get in compliance is our main goal this year. We will be striving to get every school to have a PTA that's functioning well. We thank you for the opportunities that we've had to collaborate with you and participate in your task forces, com your committees, and your events. And our mission is to make every child's potential a reality. And we feel that working together in collaboration, we can make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Our next category of speakers are our unions, and our first speaker is Billy Burke on behalf of CASE, 
who will be speaking virtually. Good evening, Vice Chairwoman Mrs. Harvey, Superintendent Dr. Yarborough, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'd like to begin by expressing my appreciation to the administrators, supervisors, teachers, and staff here in BCPS. And I want to remind you that what you do is the most important job in the world. The union is here to be your voice so you can concentrate on your job. Case's priorities remain constant. Fair compensation and benefits, reasonable work hours, work-life balance, ethical accountability, and appropriate resources and support. This year, you will hear me speak on four consistent themes. One, the impact of the staffing shortage and strategies to mitigate the effects of that shortage. Two, special education staffing and supports. Three, safety. And four, work-life balance for all case members, but specifically for assistant principals. Assistant principals represent the majority of case members, and I hear from them daily that their responsibilities are not reasonable and resourced to meet the requirements of state laws in regard to special education, testing, and discipline. You have chosen to teach and lead. Have a great year. I am so proud of you, and you have so much respect for me for you. Surround yourself with other teachers and leaders that uplift you. This year, center your self-care around asking for what you need in order to do your best work on behalf of students. Case members, your presence and dedication inspire all of us. I'd like to take a moment to thank Dr. Yar Yarborough and Ms. Charlie Green for collaborating with Case and talking honestly about our concerns. Case is grateful to be included in the transition work. There is reason to be hopeful moving forward. Thank you all for the opportunity to speak on behalf of Case. Have a great year. Thank you. Our next speaker in this category is Cindy Sexton of TAPCO. Good evening, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Yarborough, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Just want to know where did the summer go? As we are starting another school year, I first want to speak to all the educators. Please make sure that as you are planning lessons for your students, trying to juggle the work-home balance and the countless other tasks that educators do every single day, you remember that your mental, emotional, and physical health are a priority. Anxiety can be high for some, and it is important to take care of you. Take care of you so you will have the ability to do all the other things too. We are here for the students. Focus on the positives they bring to your classroom and focus on the why you got into teaching. The top priorities identified in the Fast Forward Entry Plan are ambitious and necessary. Our number one priority must be to improve student learning, and we need to make sure our educators are at the forefront of all that entails. Dr. Yarbrough, as your team plans, please continue to get the input of educators, those boots on the ground with our students, so we can proactively prepare and implement. If we aren't in the conversations when plans are created and decisions being made, we lose time fixing it on the other side. We know we will face challenges, but if we face them together, anticipate concerns, and course correct before they grow, we will be in a better place for our students. I ask the same of the board members. Please reach out to educators, to TABCO. Let's do the work on the front end so things run smoothly and we can focus on instruction. We're also getting ready to start negotiations for a three-year contract. Let's be sure we get that done efficiently and quickly by the contract deadline of November 30th. Let's not be distractive. distracted. We all have so much on our plates. Let's be sure we are all doing all we can, keeping in mind that our students' learning conditions are our teachers' working conditions. And of course, that our decisions are one that will retain the educators we have. 
let's be sure we show them with our actions we want them to remain in BCPS to help this system become the world-class system we all want. I look forward to seeing our students and staff next week and throughout the year. We need every single one of them to be there for our students. Thank you and have a great year. Thank you. Next are the nonprofit community groups. And our first speaker is LaTanya Lynn, our only speaker of the Baltimore County Chapter of Continental Societies, Inc. Good evening, good evening, Dr. Yarbrough, board chair, vice chair, and board members. My name is Lynn Loing, and I'm the president of the Baltimore County Chapter of the Continental Society, Inc. The mission of the Continental Society, Inc., Baltimore County Chapter, is to create environments within our communities that empower children to have access to quality and appropriate opportunities to reach their optimal potential. This program year, 2023-2024, the Baltimore County Chapter Continental Societies will focus on literacy development, just one of the national initiatives that is dear to our national president, Lillette Campbell. In contemporary thinking, literacy is described as the basic ability to read and write. Many formal definitions exist as the ability to read, write, speak, and listen in the ways that let us communicate effectively and make sense of the world. Baltimore County Chapter supports this definition and believes that in addition to reading and writing, literacy affords young people the ability to solve problems at the levels of proficiency necessary for them to function successfully on the job and in the family and in society. In this regard, the Baltimore County will design programs such as book drives, readathons, poetry con contests, just to name a few, to enhance the literacy skills of our children and youth by continuing to partner with the Baltimore County Public Schools and support for the children and youth of Baltimore County. It takes a village. Our children, our commitment, our concern. Again, congratulations, Dr. Yarbrough. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lawings. Our next uh, category is individual citizens and students, and our first speaker is Sharon Saroff. Good evening. Good evening. I want to start off by giving a compliment to one of their schools. Um, I had the pleasure of walking the halls of Lansdowne High School, which is the high school that my, both of my kids graduated from, and I had that pleasure last week. Um, the reason I'm complimenting Lansdowne is the principal um, has set up a system in her school building that if a child, for instance, has an IEP and they have a problem with uh, math, that they get two math classes. One which teaches the regular curriculum, but at a slower pace. And the other is a remedial math class to get those gaps addressed. What a concept. The reason I'm bringing this up is because most of my high school clients are not getting that. What they're getting is a modified class curriculum or a medial class, and they're simply not making progress. That concerns me. I was at, uh, virtually at the uh, Maryland State Board this morning, as I had public comment to do, and I know they released the uh, most recent scores. Our math scores haven't moved they're still way down. Maybe that has to do with the way we're teaching our students. I'm not saying that our teachers are bad teachers. I know a great many 
wonderful teachers in our county that go out of their way and do a beautiful job. I've only to look at my own kids to see how good a job they do. But we need to do things consistently across the county and not have one school give their students something better than another school. If we want our, if we're going to concentrate on scores, if we're going to concentrate on improving the school system again, we need to lead with consistency and make sure that every single child gets what they need. And that's not happening right now. And that's again why I come here. Because I want to see the current students get what my kids got and be as successful as my kids are. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Bosch Farum. Good evening to all. I want to give you an idea about UPS and McDonald, my favorite. Uh, that relates to education. The uh, unions in UPS were on strike. They ask a lot of money. And today, the contract has been ratified which really increases the cost of each employee in UPS to a high level, which means the company will not make any money for the whole year. McDonald, on the other hand, is making money, even in the darkest day of COVID. Automation, smart advertising, smart menus, and they are doing it. 7% dividend. I think our school system can benefit of these lessons. The way I see it on this side, unless you have the high technology of hardware and software, you will not really be able to fulfill many of the dreams that we all share. AI, for instance, there is a school in Auckland that is applying artificial intelligence in the school system. And I will fill you on that in future events. The other really weakness in the system is we know that there is no enough state and county money, right? Our governor was on the news already asking everybody to kind of like expect tightening the belt. So I know I said this before. Why not really use the system outside the box to accept advertisements from Apple, Microsoft, NVIDIA, you name it, even Coke, McDonald. Why not really use McDonald in the facilities and get some revenue, all right? Why not really focus on the educational foundation so they have enough donations, just like all these hospitals around us that really get tremendous amount of support, but you really don't see the same thing in the school system. 25 years being here, I haven't seen one single student graduate and come back to volunteer, except maybe for Christian. I think he came back in summer and did a month of volunteering. I don't see anybody really give large donations. Thank you, Dr. Farron. Please stay seated if you would. Next is public comment on board policy 8260, and our only speaker is Dr. Farron. My computer is down there. All 
All right, so my computer died off. Oh, here it is. Ms. Pomfrey, this is a critique and not criticism. I really love your committee and I appreciate you. Okay, this policy in line five to eight says that the Board of Education is a body politic. I don't like that. Then in line six, it says individual board members shall have no authority to make decisions, commit, etc. And the worst one comes on line 13 and 15, the board shall not, that's very strong, shall not be bound in any way by any action or statement. I understand the action. The statement is the one that I disagree. So my thought about the word politic, today's politic is not the same as 50 years ago when I came to Baltimore. Today's politic means people not really telling the truth. It has a bad connotation. I suggest that you use something like the governing body. That's what the Board of Education is. Next thing is, it's clearly that board members are reluctant to speak by email or in meetings or to stand up in a meeting and give any lengthy presentations. I feel that board members have some silent, hidden gag order that they would not really answer emails and would not really be specific except on rare occasions. And I think that's really wrong. So with that, what I recommend for you, that this policy does not convey what your duties and responsibilities. It does not. And do not really tell me that there are other policies that cover. When we, the public, see this policy, we see that you are not really supposed to talk, statement, you're not supposed to decide for the board, I understand, and that's it. It doesn't talk, for instance, about you are the leader for the educational profession, that you will stand for the highest standards of ethics, that you will put the interests of the patients first. It doesn't really say anything about your commitment towards diversity in education. It doesn't say anything about your vision or any other similar things. This policy also refers to 8260, which states that the board reflects the aspiration and desires of the citizens. I really don't see that myself. I see basically contracts. Thank you, Dr. Farrell. That concludes our public comments for this evening. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that I call on Mr. Burns. Vice Chair Arvey, Dr. Yarbrough, members of the board, uh, for the record, Darren Burns, board counsel. Uh, in your closed session, the board considered uh, the matter uh, on summary affirmance for our hearing examiner case 23-34. At this time, it's appropriate for the board to take action confirming what it did in closed session. Thank you, Mr. Burns. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on hearing examiner's case HE 23-34 and authorize Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not physically present? So moved, from Pong. Thank you. Is there a second? Savoy second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Jaminowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Drummond? 
Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is new business report on board policies. This is the first reader for this policy, and for that, I call on Ms. Christina Pumphrey, Chair of the Policy Review Committee. Thank you. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendation to, re to readopt board policy 8260, duties and responsibilities, authority of individual board members. This policy is presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit H. May I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the board's Policy Review Committee for board policy 8260? So moved from Pong. Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Tominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's transition team report. And for that, I call on Dr. Yarbrough. Thank you, Vice Chair Harvey, members of the board. I appreciate the opportunity this evening to provide you with a overview on the transition team report and our next steps. Next slide, please. Just as a reminder, 39 people uh, were gracious enough to lend their expertise to Team BCPS. The group consisted of internal and external st stakeholders, experts, and partners. Uh, they worked for 21 days with a defined scope of work and were divided into five committees. Their purpose was to review major components across Team BCPS, teaching and learning, operations, and culture and context. After they had a solid understanding, they were to produce a product that was a user-friendly operational report that summarized their findings, identified no more than three short-term recommendations, and one to two long-term recommendations. Their process included review of artifacts, interviews with leadership of various departments and divisions, as well as interviews with focus groups, including end users. Next slide, please. The five subcommittees were infrastructure, culture and climate, operations, teaching and learning, and community engagement and communication. The team specifically looked at the purpose and current services provided by all groups. They examined the current state, discussed the desired state, and identified recommendations that fill the gap. Next step, please. So the first subcommittee is teaching and learning. The goal of teaching and learning is to make sure that all of our instruction is accessible to all students that we serve across Team BCPS, to build the capacity of teachers to do their best work on a daily basis, and to provide students a rigorous and responsive curriculum. The transition team findings included needs in professional development across groups, improvement needed for teacher retention, as well as coordination across departments in Team BCPS. Recommendations included providing consistent access to high quality professional development, creating a robust teacher retention plan focused on those early years of teaching, and ensuring that our goals were aligned with the aims of the blueprint. Next slide, please. With respect to culture and climate, our goal across Team BCPS is to make sure that we have learning environments that are safe, respectful, and inclusive for staff and students. Ensuring that schools and offices were positive and welcoming, as well as supporting wellness for all. The findings of the subcommittee included work to be done to ensure that everyone has a sense of belonging, needs to enhance safety for students and staff, 
and again, coordination across departments and divisions regarding climate and culture is an area of need. Their recommendations included developing several engagement opportunities throughout the year, throughout Team BCPS, to improve climate and culture, to foster more efforts to coordinate school and office collaboration, as well as a comprehensive system-wide safety support plan. In the area of community engagement and communication, our goal is to make sure that we are communicating in a thoughtful way with all of our stakeholders. We want to make sure that our communication is open and effective across schools and offices with internal and external stakeholders. Findings of the team included a need to update our resources and centralize access for staff as well as external stakeholders. Inefficiency in communication between offices and schools, so a need to make sure that our, our internal steps were more efficient, as well as a need for services and programs to meet the needs of our multilingual families. Recommendations included communication training and resources for all staff, launching a campaign for stakeholders to ensure that they knew how to access and navigate our different resources, and establishing clear communication expectations and protocols across Team BCPS. In the area of infrastructure, the goal is to make sure that we are strategically leveraging resources so that we can advance student achievement and operations enhancement. We want to make sure that we have intentional coordinated efforts to attract, recruit, retain, and develop staff. Findings included areas of need around retention for staff years one through five, a need to increase the number of nationally board certified teachers, as well as respond to and provide updates to the existing human resources recommendations. Recommendations from the team and in infrastructure included having specific implementation staff for the new ERP program, assessing the effectiveness of automation across Team BCPS, and making sure that there was alignment between the blueprint the career ladder, and the National Board Certified Teacher Stipends. And the final area of focus was operations, with the goal of improved performance and efficiency of school facilities, as well as making sure we have, that we have high quality school facilities and learning environments for all of our students. Findings centered around staff recruitment and retention efforts that were needed for the operations side, as well as consistent data monitoring. Recommendations, again, pointed to a need for consistent, high-quality professional development experiences, that we provide resources for the implementation plan for the new ERP program that will focus on high-quality data integrity, as well as all systems speaking across BCPS and stronger collaboration with our government partners. As the transition team worked across divisions and offices, they highlighted five overarching themes. Number one, a need for document and strategy coherence, meaning that our documents need to be aligned to the strategies that we are choosing to move forward with as a school system. Culture of communication and inclusion, the report spoke to a need for us to have a focused and coordinated, and coordinated efforts around improving climate and morale and making sure that all staff and students felt included. Safety and infrastructure. This was directly in alignment with the identified priorities of Team BCPS, ensuring enhanced safety measures in schools as well as moving forward with planned infrastructure upgrades. Data diagnosis, 
the need to always identify what our progress monitoring is going to look like, hold ourselves accountable, as well as course correct when needed, was identified as an overarching theme across departments. And finally, the root cause analysis cycle. It is the belief of the team that these, this process that was used for this transition report is a good process and is a process that team Baltimore, uh, Baltimore County Public Schools should engage in on a regular basis. Taking the time to engage across departments and divisions to find out the current state and the desired state was a practice that was recommended. Our next steps include the following. No later than August 31st, we will share the full transition report with all members of Team BCPS. A community message will be sent out and information will be posted to the website with guidance. Within 30 days following the release of the report, cabinet as well as divisions will review the short-term recommendations and decide on next steps. Those decisions will be posted on our website. 60 days later, we will be implementing our accepted short-term recommendations as well as sharing a timeline on our website. And 90 to 120 days following, we will have a plan developed for the longer-term recommendations that were provided by the transition team as well as provide an update on our review and measure of the implementation, specifically the impact of those short-term recommendations and adjust as necessary. All of this information will be provided to Team BCPS and posted on our website. I want to take a moment to give special thanks to our co-chairs of the transition team, Dr. Douglas Anthony, as well as Ms. Jill Snell, as well as all of the 39 members, uh, internal and external stakeholders that gave of their time, their expertise uh, in service of Baltimore County Public Schools. With that, turn it back over to Vice Chair Harvey, open it up for any questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yarbrough, for that report. Are there any questions? Mr. McMillian. I think it's an excellent, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it's an excellent idea, the transition team involving all these different people. I understand the value of goals, but my concern is as we frame this, how are we protecting against finding what we want to find? You know, the frame piece, and, and so it, how do we get that outlier thing out there that might be critical to the success of the system, but we missed that because we didn't, we framed to get this or to look to this or to find this. How do we protect against that? Well, I appreciate that question, Mr. McMillian. I think that goes to the transition team's recommendation that this should not be a one and done, that we should be in a process where we're always examining what's happening across Team BCPS. And I think the beauty of having a transition team or a team similar to that, when you have internal stakeholders and the internal experts who know the work that they're doing and you bring in some outside experts with different perspectives and experiences, that I, I think those two things coupled will help us uh, to make sure that we're taking a total and complete picture of you know, what is occurring in Team BCPS, as well as uh, acting on some of the recommendations to be out in the community, to be engaging with a variety of stakeholders on a regular basis um, to hear the feedback of Team BCPS. Thank you very much, and that's a very thoughtful answer. Thank you. Ms. Hinn. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair, and thank you, Dr. Yarborough, for the presentation. I appreciate um, the work of the transition um, team, this presentation, and the excellent summary we received. My question is, can you speak to any ideas that were new to you, Dr. Yarborough, as a um, that came out of the transition team? A lot of these themes are things that We've heard before, um, unsurprisingly, but any new ideas that you can share with us that came out of this group? Thank you. So thank you for the question. Uh, Ms. Hen, I am uh, happy to do a follow-up on new ideas. Uh, in terms of the summary that I shared, uh, 
it's not that those ideas were new necessarily, but I think they uh, affirmed and confirmed that we're moving forward in the right direction, that the feedback that we've been receiving from the community meet and greets, putting that in alignment with our data analysis, that we've done all of the conversations with uh, building leaders as well as central office leaders. I think having this kind of uh, this mixed methods, if you will, approach that the transition team uh, took helped us to make sure that we're moving in the right direction. In terms of things that were new, I would say, um, while I don't want to get ahead of the release of the full report, um, you know, the group was able to identify some specific spaces that we need to look towards as we move forward, which I think is very helpful. Um, I shared a little bit of that in the overview. Specifically, I'm speaking about uh, ERP implementation and the significant investment that we're making in that and what steps do we want to make sure that we're taking um, so that we're moving forward successfully. They also spoke about the blueprint and making sure that um, any next steps we take as a system, that we have an eye towards uh, making sure that we're in alignment with what the law calls for. So those would be two areas that I would point out and would be happy to do a follow-up with some additional specifics after the release of the full report. Thank, thank you for that response. I just have one follow-up, and if this is in the full report, I can wait on that. But I'm curious as to whether there were any specific recommendations regarding the continued use of virtual learning as an alternate learning environment for those students who are not thriving in the traditional classroom setting? I don't recall that, so I, I'll have to follow up with you on that. Ms. Hen, happy to do that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hen. Before we move on to Ms. Booker Dwyer, Dr. Yarbrough, will you explain for the public what ERP implementation is? Yes. Uh, specifically, ERP is really, it is our system that um, governs all of the business practices across uh, Team BCPS, um, specifically payroll, human resources, um, I'm missing a department, uh, technology, making sure that all of our data um, is in line and all of we have high quality data integrity and all of the programs uh, speak to each other is what ERP does. Thank you. Ms. Booker Dwyer. Thank you. So I'm excited by the transition report and the, the team that you've pulled together um, for this. And so my I just have two questions. I, I know the team came up with several Area, so several recommendations. Is it the intent of Baltimore County to implement all of the recommendations or will there be some recommendations that you all will focus on and others will be kind of, okay, this is nice, but we'll get to that a little later. So that was part of the thinking behind tiering the recommendations, the short term versus the long term. So our first, um, you know, uh, first thing that we need to do is take a look at the short-term recommendations. When we're sitting with cabinet members as well as uh, members of departments to make sure that we're in alignment with what the short-term recommendations are. Ensuring, for example, that there's not a short-term recommendation that we already have a plan for or a short-term recommendation that may inadvertently um, conflict with you know, something that we have to abide by. So we have to do that first sort of uh, scrubbing of the recommendations. After that, within 60 days, our plan is to make sure that we're implementing everything that's sound that's going to help us make improvements in Team BCPS. Within that next year, 90 days to 120 days, that's when the plan will be out for how we're going to implement the long-term recommendations. But of course, looking at it with the same lens, making sure that we don't have anything that's identified that we are that's already in process that perhaps you know we haven't shared publicly so the first thing is going to be to take a deep dive with cabinet as well as departments and divisions of the recommendations of the team so i love that because that also just kind of uh, started to answer my second question around the recommendations and how are they going to complement or conflict with you know there's so many plans um, in the school district with the blueprint the compass title one title two special ed it just goes on and on and on and so how will this be message you know, just to think about how this will be messages and messaged and um, shared with school-based staff so that it's implemented as intended without them feeling like this is yet another plan, another thing that we have to do, and it'll just go by the wayside as well. So um, so that's also just something I want to keep on the, the forefront. 
Absolutely, and I appreciate you saying that. Coherence is definitely one of our goals. Um, in terms of school-based staff, it would be our hope that school-based staff see as a result of us implementing these recommendations that things are improving for them, but that really as central offices, we wrap our arms around these recommendations and decide on what those best next steps are. Are there any other questions, Mr. Young? Dr. Yarbrough, if I heard you correctly, um, you mentioned that they said that this shouldn't be really a one and done process, correct? Correct. So did they provide any recommendation as for what the next group that comes back should look like as far as whether the same people, new people, and expanded scope? They did not. Um, I, I think what they were really pointing to is all of the feedback, not only the feedback you know, from themselves as member of the team, but as they went out and engaged in their focus groups, a lot of people um, really re reflected and shared with them uh, enjoying being a part of the process and feeling that to the degree that we are always out engaging with stakeholders and hearing their feedback, uh, that would help us in terms of <laughs> continuous improvement. And so their recommendation was uh, more broad, but it was uh, specific in terms of creating a process uh, where we are examining uh, documents as well as, um, you know, ha engaging with people is a strong format that works and they would recommend that, you know, we do this beyond just the transition time that we come back to uh, people to find out what's working across Team BCPS and what's not as we move forward with some of the changes that we must implement. Thank you. Any other discussion? Uh, I just want to say that I appreciate the attention to detail, the deliberateness with which this work was done and the aggressive timeline uh, for moving through this process. We all understand that we have a moral imperative to make sure that every child who attends a BCPS school gets a quality and equitable education. And I believe that the steps that the, the transition team came up with and your subsequent uh, recommendations will start the process of moving us there. So thank you very much. We look forward to getting future reports on how we're doing. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Ms. Stileski has um, One question. quick comment. Um, just in terms of the ERP implementation, which sounds like it's going to be amazing and very efficient, um, it might be, and maybe we're planning on doing this, so I'm sorry to be repetitive, but to really educate the public on how the ERP implementation will make the business side of BCPS more efficient. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the work session on the FY 2025 state capital budget request. And for that, I call on Mr. Dixit. Good evening, Chair Harvey, uh, Superintendent Dr. Yarbrough, members of the board. Uh, just to refresh your memory, we presented, uh, introduced, we introduced the state capital budget request 2025 to you in the last meeting. We are here to present the work session information. Uh, I'll repeat some of the things that I shared with you go over the changes that we have made and why those changes have been made, and also uh, this, the schedule and go over the spreadsheet. So with that, uh, uh, as I shared last time, there are two different sources of funding, capital program for state and the capital county program. Capital funds are provided annually by the state, and once in two years, by the county. The current plan that is in front of you for approval is for FY 2025 and for state. The numbers that have been included, they will evolve over a period of time. They'll be updated. And when we come to you next time for our budget presentation, we'll share that number with you. The reason for is, is the reviews by county and state fiscal partners and also the latest uh, cost estimate that are available in different stages of the design. Uh, the, the attachments that you have is the 
final board approved FY 2024 county capital budget requ request form that board approved in last January. The second exhibit is the proposed FY 2025 state capital budget request. And the third exhibit is the state and county budget schedule for 2025. A lot of this information gets confusing, so we'll sort it out as much as I can. Uh, the 2025 budget request will be submitted and approved. Uh, this is the county one in the, in the December, January timeframe. All of the projects that have been fully funded, they have been or, or, or they have received planning approval by the state in FY 2024. They have been removed from FY 2025 request and the priorities have been readjusted accordingly. There have been no changes to the priority from what board had approved. The project included in 2025 request that is here are similar to the FY 2024 submission for the state with the following changes, and I'll give you the reason for the changes. Deer Park Elementary School, Scott's Branch Elementary School, and Dundalk High School addition, they will be fully funded through Build to Learn Act funds, and they have been removed from this submission. Uh, projects that have been added from 2024 county capital request are Northeast Area High School and Patapsco High School addition. The, the uh, funds shown here are the remaining capital need after depleting the Build to Learn Act funds, uh, which is Towson High School. You will see a little bit of amount that we have added uh, even after we use all the Build to Learn Act funds, funds. Local planning approval was obtained last year from Delaney High School. Some of the systemic projects that are classified as infrastructure improvements, uh, the last fiscal year that are not shown were funded either through the state's capital program or through the Healthy School Facility Fund, and there, therefore they have been removed from this request. The following projects have been added. These are the systemic projects. Sandalwood Elementary School, Mechanical System Upgrade. Timber Grove Elementary School, Mechanical System Upgrade. Pretty Boy Elementary School, Mechanical System Upgrade. Westchester Elementary School, Roof Replacement. Fullerton Elementary School, Mechanical System Upgrade and Roof Replacement, Sandy Plains Elementary School, Roof Replacement, Dundalk Middle School, Roof Replacement, Edgemere Elementary School, Roof Replacement, Eastern Tech High School, Electrical System Upgrade, Winfield Elementary School, Mechanical System Upgrade and Roof Replacement, Woodbridge Elementary School, Mechanical System Upgrade, McCormick Elementary School Roof Replacement, Villa Crusta Elementary School Roof Replacement, 7th District Elementary School Mechanical System Upgrade, Wynan Elementary School Roof Replacement, and Hereford Middle School Roof Replacement. Um, in addition to that, I would like to go over some of the columns that are in the spreadsheet. Uh, the the, the board exhibit priority order column. This lists the priority orders for each project. The second column is the uh, name of school. The third column is the area, which shows whether they are from the southwest, northwest, central, southeast, or southwest area. The project column shows the type of project being proposed at that school. Type of approval, which is um, uh, as per the state process, it shows whether the request is for local planning or for funding. Funding means the construction funds. Uh, farms percentages added in the next column. Then the column of total state funding share that represents the total amount of funding being requested of the state. Prior state funding column represents the amount of state funding approved in previous year for that project. And 
the state funding request represents the amount of state funding recommended by uh, public school construction program uh, to the NRA agency commission for approval. A state funding request FY 2026 represents the amount of state funding for FY 2026 for that particular project based on cash flow. And there were several footnotes, and I'll go over some of the footnotes so that we have better understanding of that. Um, footnote three explains that the state funding may be spread over multiple years to align with cash flow projections. Four explains that the Towson High School project is being included because it may require funds through the capital improvement program in addition to Build to Learn Act funds. Footnote five explains that these projects are expected to include enclosing the open space classrooms. Number six explains that the amount indicated here for Towson High School is the estimated amount of CIP funding needed to supplement the Build to Learn Act funding. Footnote seven explains that the priorities for the systemic projects listed six through 21 are subject to adjustment by the superintendent if it's in the best interest in supporting the instructional program. The board will be notified if there's any change made by the superintendent through the superintendent's bulletin. Footnote number eight explains that this project will comply with Maryland Historical Trust requirement and will be a like new building. So this is the explanation of the spreadsheet. Uh, we had asked board to submit questions. There were two questions received and I'll share that question with you and our response. It is included in the board doc, uh, if I recollect correctly. Uh, the first question is that the replacement of Towson High School had $83 million in the FY 2024 and the amount has been changed uh, in 25 to 30 million. And this project has been downgraded to a renovation and expansion. So the response to that is that the state share of $83 million was calculated based on the cost factor of the last year's state cost factor. Based on the current formula, uh, the, the amount calculated of the state share is $110 million, which is more than uh, what was in the last year's uh, formula. Since Built to Learn Act will only provide about 80 million out of that 110 million, we are requesting additional funds of 30 million in the state capital request. So the amount is not reduced, it is increased, but the source of funding are different and only 30 million are projected to be received or requested from the state. The second question had to deal with the scope of work. So there is no change in scope of work of Towson. It will be a like new school as we had envisioned before and there is no change. Since building has a historic, por historic uh, portion, that building is required to preserve the legacy and heritage of that building uh, per the Maryland Historical Trust and that's why we have included the term renovation in addition it does not have any change or any, and anything with what we have done before. The second question that we received is about Northwest CTE Center as priority number five local planning approval requested. The question asks where is the construction of this center indicated in the My I-Pass? What projects will be deferred if the board approves this project? My IPAS list CT program is priority four, and why has the project been escalated over those My IPAS that are more critical? So the answer is the My IPAS has CTE center included in there and is under the caption of educational strategy. So we have not added any new priority for CTE center and 
this request is for planning only, and this will not change any priority of the other projects that were included before or that are being included now. So those were the questions and responses. Um, our plan is to bring it back next in the next board meeting for your approval. If you have any questions now, we'll try to respond if we have the answer, or we'll take it and write it down and get back to you later on. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. We do have some questions from the board. First, we'll take questions from Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair, and good evening, Mr. Dixit. Good evening. Thank you for answering those um, questions that I had submitted. I did have a follow-up um, regarding Towson and regarding project funding in general. Where can the board review um, the total funding, um, both state and local, for all of our projects in the portfolio? And in other words, I understand that the difference is being allocated through Built to Learn, which is also a state um, fund, but there are multiple state school construction funds. Is there anywhere that the board and public, more importantly, can review what projects are in the pipeline and where um, those sources of funding can be found? So um, when, that's a good question. Thank you for asking that question. Board gets a detailed binder when we submit uh, the request to state, and that has all of the projects that are included in here, the detailed worksheet, uh, including cost breakdown and including enrollment projections for future and current enrollment projections. So that's one place. The spreadsheet that we share with you for state and county uh, budget request have just about all the costs that you can think of included in those spreadsheets, and they are part of board doc, so they are available. Okay, but those aren't available, I apologize. Those aren't available to the public. Where can the public find that information, as well as the prioritization of the projects? Uh, my understanding is that our, our, our budget request is a public document and it is posted on the BCPS website also. Correct, and, and thank you. I understand that for this spreadsheet. I'm, I'm asking where the public can review all projects and to see the total amount of funding um, because it would be helpful to see, okay, 80 million from Built to Learn, 30 million from CIP, and really to educate the public about the various state funding sources because this document while helpful for our purposes, can be somewhat misleading to the public who may not realize that there are multiple buckets of school construction funding provided by the state, and that this is this just reflects the CIP. Yeah. So these are uh, these are uh, the document. The source. <clears throat> there are several sources where public can find information. This is a request, which eventually gets converted into an approval document from the IAC and that has cost numbers. So that's one source where the information is available to general public. Uh, and we provide as much possible as we can on the BCPS website. I have Mr. Plate with me, and if I missed anything, please share with the board. I think you covered all the examples. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, and, and my last question, and, and I'm mindful of the fact that other board members have questions as well, has to do with the prioritization um, Mr. Dixie, can you clarify the order of projects? Because I know some of the approvals are for limited planning, um, or local planning rather, and some are for actual construction. So to see all of the projects on one list prioritized like this, is that the order in which planning happens? I know we don't focus on just one project at a time, but can you explain that process? It, it would seem that we would have two lists, right? Projects that are being planned and projects that are actively being built. So I'm trying to understand the prioritization and, and how that, what that looks like played out. So if one looks at the county uh, plan, which has more details on the priority and which also has funding for design, uh, that's the priority which really is coming from uh, my iPass 
from superintendent's conversation with, with community, our dialogue here, right here in the board meeting, uh, with our conversation with county and state fiscal partners, combination of all of this uh, determines the priority that you have in, in county plan. And once the funding is approved in the county budget for design, and design gets to a certain level, then it's included in the state request that you are seeing. So it is a complex process, which we try to simplify it by talking here, by presenting in different documents for a better understanding. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Are there any additional questions from the board? Ms. Frimpong. Um, just a, I guess a general slash specific question. The number five priority Northwest Area CTE Center, you mentioned, you mentioned that it is planning, correct? That's correct. So typically, I guess, what is that time frame between when we can actually start to see, I guess, money set aside for the actual construction? That's a good question, and, and, and that's a project that we started uh, about 12 months ago, the educational specification, which is the pre-design document that has been completed. Uh, county has provided funds for the design. We are uh, going to be starting uh, selection of architectural team soon, and uh, so in the next uh, next meeting, then when we come to you in December, January time frame, we'll be able to share the more progress on that project. The challenge right now is to find a site. A site has to be found before we start the design work. But we are excited about that project. Thank you, Ms. Rimpong. Are there any other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. So I'd like to conclude by um, acknowledging the guidance and leadership that Dr. Yarbrough has provided in preparing this, uh, this uh, capital program, and we are very grateful for it. And the funding partners, the state and county, uh, particularly county, who has been very kind to us and worked with us in some of these difficult projects, so I'd like to take this time. And my team, construction and improvement team and planning team, headed by Mr. Plate and Mr. Paul Taylor, he's here someplace. Uh, so it's, and, and also the team from Mr. Hartler's organization that have helped us put it all together. Thank and you. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is board committee updates and agenda setting. First, we will have the committee updates we will start with the audit committee. Mr. McMillian, please proceed. Uh, our next meeting is Tuesday, September 19th at 4.30. We've taken a break over the summer, so we're going to resume on Tuesday, September 19th at 4.30. So please turn on, tune in virtually. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. We'll move to the budget committee. Ms. Dominowski. Uh, yes, our next budget committee meeting will be virtually 5.30, September 20th. Um, and please tune in. Next is the Building and Contracts Committee. We will meet on September 11th at 5 p.m. virtually, and we hope that you all will join us to learn about our contract process. Thank you. We'll also move on to the Curriculum Committee. Is there a spokesperson for Chair Lichter for Curriculum? Our next. Thank our you, next, Ms. Yeah, <laughs> yeah our, um, our next meeting for curriculum is Thursday, September 7th at 4.30, also virtual. Please tune in again. Thank you. We'll move on to Equity Committee. Dr. Savoy. Yes, um, the Equity Committee met virtually August 17th at 4 p.m. We were very privileged to listen to an exemplary and distinctive presentation from Ms. Leslie Weber as she talked about the benefits of parent-teacher organizations. Many thanks to Mr. Douglas Handy and Ms. Sue Hahn for facilitating. The next meeting will be held on Thursday, September 14th at 5 p.m. through Teams. Thank you. Thank you. And the Legislative and Governmental Relations Committee, Ms. Booker Dwyer. So there's no updates at this time. We've just 
I was just appointed committee chair, so we're getting it together. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and then we have our policy review committee, Ms. Pumphrey. Along with policies that were already scheduled for review for the 23-24 school year, comments and concerns of board members and stakeholders were taken into consideration. And additional policies were added to the list for review as needed. This list of policies to be reviewed this school year is posted on board docs and a link is also posted on the BCPS website under of education tab, board policies and superintendent's rules. Our first PRC meeting of the school year is scheduled for September 18th at 430. Thank you, Ms. Pumphrey. Next are agenda items. Board members, if you have uh, agenda items for our upcoming meetings for consideration, uh, please let us know. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yep, I have a few agenda items. Um, the first one, agenda item, um, MCAT scores and really looking at what are the standards the students did well on, what are the standards that students need more support on, and um, what are the, the, really looking at the root causes of why students did not master certain standards, and what are we doing this year to address that. The second agenda item is uh, blueprint. So what is the status of the implementation of the five pillars? And this isn't something, you know, I'm looking at this to be addressed over a series of board meetings. So whether it's a standing agenda item where every board meeting we address one of the pillars or one of the components in the pillar um, to see where we are, uh, how that aligns to our implementation plan and where we are with that. The third agenda item is concerning ESSER funds. Um, we know that those funds are, um, they, they, will be, they will be expiring soon. And so what services will be stopped and continued? Um, what was the effectiveness of our use of those ESSER funds? What was our return on investments? Um, and so I would love a, to, to know more about those ESSER funds. And then um, just the transition plan and where we are with the implementation of that. And so once again, not to address at the very next board meeting, but as we look over the course of the next few board meetings to look at um, the, the recommendation implementation status. Thank you. Um, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Several of mine, um, Ms. Booker Dwyer touched on, so thank you for those. Um, I am again requesting standing agenda items for updates from the superintendent on the four strategic priorities, academic achievement, school safety and climate, staffing and infrastructure. I would appreciate updates, even if brief, at each meeting and the opportunity for board members to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other recommendations for agenda items from the board? Thank you all for those recommendations. They will be given consideration for future board meetings. The last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's public hearing on the Camp Field Early Learning Program closure will be held tomorrow, August 23rd, 2023, in the Pikesville High School Auditorium. Sign up for speakers begins at 5.30, and the hearing will begin at 6.30. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, September 12th at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight. The meeting is now adjourned. Mm -hmm.